what problems does the technology solve? And it's often good to make such comparisons because comparing stuff as complex as programming languages takes some time and we really need them to make an educated guess about what should, we, what should be the next technology we use or we learn. So that's why the plan for today's presentation is we start with defining what problems Akka and Erlang were trying to solve when they were created, then scheduling solutions from most simple to most advanced. So I will be jumping between Erlang and uh, Akka, uh, but it will make sense and it won't be very thorough. Uh, I just want you to notice how similar some of them are. Then we will see in what ways scheduling impacts programming. So, as I promised, the problem. Akka wanted to solve scalability problem. W the default way to uh, make something run on multiple threads is to use uh, OS threads. And they are very heavy, context switching is expensive, uh, locking takes up to 300 CPU cycles, and locks are very error prone. And they are the only way to communicate because we need shared memory and we need to synchronize somehow. Then scaling out requires completely another paradigm. And this means that we don't have shared memory between many nodes. So Scala tried to solve this problem of scalability. Uh, in case of Erlang, the problem was completely different. So in Erlang, uh, people tried to run the software on switches or routers that were very, very expensive. And there were stateful connections or phone calls. And the idea was that in case we have many phone calls and one of them crashes even due to programmer bug or an error, none other should be affected. And the other thing was because those things were so damn expensive, they didn't want to buy two of them. And for example, when you do upgrade, you just switch one off and then the other takes the load. No, you had one and it should be operating all the time. So they needed hot code upgrades. So as we can see, the problems are fairly different. And if we compare the solutions, Akka went with actors and Erlang went with actors for two completely different reasons. So let's compare how actors work in both of them. In Akka, sender sends a message through an actor ref to other actor. In Erlang, sender sends a message through a process identifier. In both cases, message is enqueued in a mailbox. And in Akka, dispatcher runs a mailbox. And it was fairly confusing for me at first because why do we run a mailbox and not an actor? Actually, mailbox is an instance of runnable from Java. And then I thought maybe a message could be a runnable too, but we want actor to preserve state. So that means that we don't want one actor running on two OS threads at the same time, which means that having mailbox as an instance of runnable makes a lot of sense. In Erlang, the scheduler runs a process with its mailbox. So we can see that on, in Akka, the level on which we work is the message level. And in Erlang, we work on a process level. And it is because Akka is uh, cooperative. The scheduling is cooperative. The thread needs to give up an execution so that another actor can run. And in Erlang, scheduling is preemptive, which means that we could interrupt a process at any point in time pause it, and then come back to it later. And actually, this preemptiveness feature is uh, what makes uh, Erlang complex and, how, and why we need entire VM. It's just for the preemptiveness. OK, so what is a scheduler? Usually, we have much more actors than we have CPUs or OS threads. So we need an abstraction that maps those actors to those CPUs. And it should have at least three qualities. It should maximize throughput. If we have some work to do, we want it to complete as fast as possible. We should minimize latency. So when we submit new work, then we should get the answer as fast as we can. And those two actually can be mutually exclusive, which uh, isn't a uh, very well known fact. We also should maximize fairness. So we shouldn't starve any tasks. And we can't optimize for all at once, unfortunately. <laughs> so now we will go through the schedulers. And the simplest one is single thread scheduler from Erlang. 
Then we will go to multiple thread scheduler. Then we jump to ACA to see default dispatcher with thread pool executor. Then default dispatcher with fork join pool. Then back to Erlang to scheduler with multiple run queues. And again to ACA to dispatcher with affinity pool. So there will be a lot of jumping. And this is because I want to compare the solutions from the most simple to most advanced one. So let's get back to uh, year 2006. And there was a scheduler in Erlang which ran in one OS thread. It had a single run queue and it just picked a process from this run queue, ran it either to its completion or until it gets preempted. And then if there were any new tasks found, they got to the end of the run queue. And it was beautiful, simple solution. It didn't require any logs or synchronization because it was running only in one OS thread, which means it didn't run in parallel. This might come as a surprise to someone who knows that Erlang is marketed as this language for high scalability. It wasn't the case up to 2006. The main reason the scheduler existed was the isolation. The processes could crash independently of each other without affecting the rest of the system. But people knew that when we have this couple of processes, then we should be able to somehow parallelize the work. So multiple schedulers were introduced and we had one scheduler per uh, CPU and each of them ran in its own OS thread and there was still only one single run queue. This was in Erlang R11B and R12B. The problem with that solution is that now we need to synchronize and we usually do that with locks. And it was okay solution for that time because the gains for running stuff in parallel were usually much bigger than the penalty incurred by locking, but it didn't scale well. So if we, for example, have a core with uh, a processor with 64 cores, all of the schedulers need to tap into this single run queue. So enough about Erlang for a minute. Let's now jump to Akka. In Akka, there is something called default dispatcher with thread pool executor. And if you compare those two solutions, they look exactly the same. So in Erlang, we had scheduler. And in Akka, we have OS thread. The scheduler in Erlang also ran in one OS thread. Instead of run queue, we have a task queue. And instead of processes, we have tasks. So this is very similar. And this isn't actually the scheduler that is normally used with Akka because the, it has its special use case. In Akka, when we have the task queue and multiple threads, we usually pick a task from a queue, then run a number of messages for that actor. This number of messages is a parameter in configuration and it is called throughput. If we set it to one, we have the lowest throughput because we only process one message and then another actor comes out, there's a context switch. If we set it to some higher value, we can process many messages from one actor in the thread. So the throughput gets better. Then we pick another task and so on. However, the problem comes when we have a blocking operation. And the best idea is to avoid blocking operations at all in uh, ACA actors. But sometimes, for example, when we want to wait for user input, those actors are necessary. And uh, in that case, we use the dispatcher I showed before. It has finite, finite number of OS threads. So we can say that at most this number of actors will block. The dispatcher that we usually use in ACA is the dispatcher with fork join pool. And it is similar to what we had before, but instead of one common task queue, we have now one task queue per OS thread. And it is much nicer because when we want to get a task from the queue, we don't have to synchronize. Also, the thing that we have to worry about now is that sometimes some of the queues will be overloaded and some of them will be empty. In that case, we need work stealing. This still requires some synchronization, but it scales much better. If we have now 64 cores, usually those OS threads will, will tap into the correct, correct queue. Now we're jumping again to Erlang and we can see that the scheduler that is currently used in Erlang, which is after R13B, 
is almost the same as the thing with fork join pool. So instead of OS threads, we have schedulers. Again, instead of task queue, we have run queue. And instead of task, we have processes. The minor difference is that in Erlang, we have migration logic that by default works exactly the same as work stealing, but we can configure it also for preserving battery life. And in that case, all the processes will be scheduled on one run queue and one scheduler. And only if this scheduler is overloaded, we will wake up another CPU. Otherwise, it will be either preserving battery. Still, the problem with both of those solutions is that we would like to also use CPU caching as much as we can. I told you that locking takes up to 300 CPU cycles. Reaching to RAM takes up to 1000 CPU cycles. So it's much worse problem than even sporadic locking. And that's why in ACA we have a new scheduler introduced <laughs> July this year, with the Affinity Pool. And the idea is that it works really similar to the fork join pool, but the task queue on which we put the task is determined by hashing the mailbox. Actually, the algorithm is much more involved. For a small number of actors, it works differently, but you get the idea. We always run one actor in one thread, which allows us to leverage CPU caching much better. It also uses log-free queues, so instead of logs, we have instructions that take one CPU cycle. It is atomic compare and swap operation. And this way, locking is also much less of a problem. So I showed you the, maybe not history, but different kinds of dispatchers and schedulers. They are very similar between ACA and Erlang. And now the question, the big question is, why should I really care? And it is because of three things. It impacts performance, and we as developers are responsible for the performance of our applications. It impacts latency and throughput in a very subtle way that I will explain on the next slide. And it changes how we architect our code. So let's now go to the latency versus throughput problem. Let's say we have two actor systems. On the left, there's a system without preemptive scheduling, with cooperative scheduling, like for example in ACA. On the right, we have a scheduler with preemptive scheduling, like in Erlang. There are two tasks. One of them is red, and it takes ti five time units to complete. The other one is the dark blue one. It takes only one unit to complete. And the time unit I chose is the time it takes to switch context between actors. So in case we have cooperative scheduling and we scheduled two tasks at the same time, and let's say the first one to get scheduled is the long one, we firstly do it for the five time units, then there's a context switch to get to another actor, and then the short one is completed. So if we want to calculate throughput, there were two requests served, and it was in seven units of time, so we have the throughput of 0.29 uh, requests per time unit. If we want to calculate latency, we want to check when we submitted a task and when it completed. So in case of the long-running task, it was five time units, but in case of the short task, it was seven, because it needed to wait for, uh, for it in the queue. So the mean is six and a half time unit latency. If we now go to a preemptive scheduler, we can see that the long running task first started, but then it was preempted. Then we completed the short task. Then we switched back again and then completed the long running task. So if we calculate throughput, there are another two requests, but there is more time. There is eight time units, which means that the throughput is worse. It's only 0.25. But if we calculate latency, the long running task was completed in eight time units, but the short running was completed in only three time units, which means that the average latency is 5.5, which is better. And this is a thing that is inherent to the scheduling. With cooperative scheduling, you will usually get better throughput. And with uh, preemptive scheduling, you will usually get better latency. The other problem that comes with cooperative scheduling is called a long tail problem. So if we have some requests 
uh, we usually want them to finish at roughly the same time, even if our system is under load. But with cooperative scheduling, if there are requests that take more time, then the short running requests might get, long, might get longer and longer. So in this case, we usually measure the percentiles. So we get, for example, a sample of 1,000 requests, and we can see that in regular example, the blue one, they are all roughly the same, and in the red one with long tail, the longest one request is 50 times longer than average. And for example, if we take 10 longest requests, they are 30 times longer than average. And this is a problem that sometimes is caused by the scheduling. What we actually want from our application depends on the problem at hand. So for example, if we, are, uh, if we have some scientific computation and we want all the pieces of computation to finish before we have an answer, then we should prioritize throughput. However, if we have something like web application where we have many independent users, we should prioritize for latency because research shows that people only remember the slowest interactions with our website unless they are warned that this operation is heavy, like querying for something. Another thing that we have to worry about is if something is blocking or non-blocking. So as I said uh, before, when I was covering the thread pool executor, it is because in ACA, in case you really need blocking actors, you need a separate uh, dispatcher, and this separate dedicated dispatcher also needs to be connected to all those blocking actors. So this is something that we need to worry about. Sometimes it leads to more complex code. Sometimes uh, it may be even clearer to make this <coughs> distinction. So it depends, we just need to worry about. And in Erlang, this problem doesn't exist because every time a process gets to a blocking operation, it just gets preempted. So the scheduler solves that problem for us completely. Another problem that we can sometimes face is live loops. It's not a very common problem, but in cases where we made an error and one of the actors is misbehaving, it is in while true loop or it has an infinite recursion or something like that, uh, in ACA, it will block entire thread and there is very little we can do about it. In Erlang, however, it will waste many CPU cycles because it will be scheduled over and over again, but it will get preempted and it won't block everything for, uh, for entire time. We can also connect to a running system, find such processes and manually kill them. It doesn't happen often, but in cases it happens, it's really good that we have that tool uh, in our disposal. Another difference is that because ACA works on a message level and Erlang works on a process level, it's much easier to get the messages we want from the mailbox in Erlang. So for example, we have an actor that has three messages in a mailbox and we do a pattern matching so that we only want the message two because it matches uh, our pattern match. So in that case, it will be correctly taken out from the mailbox. We are now with two messages. Uh, we can process that message. And for example, if we now want a message uh, that uh, has pattern T3 and there is no such message in the queue, the process goes to sleep as if uh, there were no messages in the queue. In ACA, it's much harder to achieve. There is a thing called stashing where we can stash all the messages from the queue and then get one from it, but we have to be really explicit about it. We need to add a trait to a mailbox and to our actor. So it's not very commonly used, even though it can solve uh, some problems. Another change is that in case we want to stop an ACA actor, it has to first process the message that it is currently processing. And then if it gets a stop signal, all the messages in the queue, like M1, M2, M3, are not processed. The other thing we can do is we can send a poison pill, which will be enqueued as a last message, and then uh, all other messages will be discarded, but those M1 up to M3 will be processed. We can also send a kill signal, and in that case, 
uh, an actor throws an exception and we can deal with it uh, with its supervisor. And one thing that is really different in ACCA and Erlang is that in ACCA you can resume the actor, which means that it will discard the message that it was currently processing, but it will process everything that is in its mailbox. In Erlang, every time there's an uncut exception and we get to the supervisor, all the mailbox is gone. And it might seem a little bit hardcore, but it is connected to the selective receive. So in ACA, if we have an exception, that means that either the state of the actor was wrong or the current message was wrong. So we discard the state and the message and we're all good. We can process other messages in the mailbox. In Erlang, with selective processing, it might be the case that the error was caused because we took wrong messages from the mailbox. So it makes much more sense to kill the process with its state and with its mailbox. If we are talking about stopping a process, preemptive scheduling allows us to kill a process right away before it finishes. And uh, we can do it with, se with sending in an exit signal. And in cases we really want to do some cleanup, we can tell our process to trap exits. And that means that uh, every time we get uh, an exit signal, it will be converted to a message, a little bit like the poison pill from ACA. But again, we really want to be able to kill an actor from outside at any point in time. And that's why we have another mechanism called brutal kill. And it will always kill the process, no matter what, without giving it a chance to say its final prayers. So they, that's basically all I wanted to say. So I did a comparison based only on scheduling. In cases where we could write a system that uses the same pattern with actors and the same data structures and everything is the same and one of them is in ACA and the other is in Erlang, <laughs> then we should see that the one in ACA has higher throughput and the one in Erlang has lower latency. However, the differences might be negligible. It always depends on your problem domain, what you're optimizing for. I didn't talk about many other things in Scala uh, with Akka and Erlang, and especially given that Scala is multi-paradigm language, we can choose always the solution that fits our problem best. Erlang is always functional, so we either write it Erlang way or it won't work at all. And this sometimes accelerates learning. So for example, in Scala, if you have a Ruby developer, everything will be a DSL. If you have a Java developer, everything will be in object-oriented Scala. And if you have a Haskell developer, even Hello World will require a couple of monads. So it might be actually better to have a language that supports only one way of doing stuff. But again, it always depends on the problem domain. But the most important thing that I want to take from this presentation is that it's absolutely amazing that those two communities coexist. And it is because, uh, for example, I showed you that uh, ACA dispatchers might be heavily inspired by Erlang schedulers, but it also goes the other way around. So recently in Elixir, programmer lang Elixir programming language that is based on Erlang, uh, people are stealing solutions from ACCA stream uh, that are used to handle back pressure between actors. And it's just great. So there are two communities. One of them has different set of problems. The other one has, again, different set of problems. And when they solve those, prob solve those problems, they can exchange the knowledge. And another thing that I want you to take from this presentation is that there are patterns that just span beyond programming languages. And for example, if we know how actor libraries work in theory, we should know that they give us the scalability and fault tolerance almost by default. So we saw that ACA started with scalability and then it was natural to uh, give the supervision tree so that we have fault tolerance. And Erlang started with fault tolerance and it was almost natural to get to the scalability part. So in any language, if the implementation of actor library is good, we should see both scalability and fault tolerance. That's all I wanted to say today. If you like this presentation, you can follow me on Twitter. I don't tweet much, but when I do, it's usually about programming. And now we have some time for questions.
set how open it will switch compared to pre processes, or it's just up to the uh, virtual machine to use? Yes, you can, uh, you can change that. So the amount of time between switching uh, between actors is called the reduction count. Every time you call a function in Erlang, there are no loops in Erlang. So it uh, basically, uh, you, in every step, you call a function. So the number of functions is called reduction count, and you can set it. So you can say, how often do you want to switch context? The lower it is, the less throughput you will get, and the higher it is, the, the lower latency. Sorry, uh, the other way around, <laughs> sorry. There are also many other parameters. For example, uh, if you have a process, you can uh, make it uh, a priority one. So uh, it will be scheduled more often than the others. Also, when you uh, interface with C code, uh, in your C code, you need to remember to tell Erlang Scheduler that, okay, we run so many reductions. So in, in C code, there are no reductions, of course, uh, but you can tell manually to Scheduler that this operation took so long, and this is so that the C code doesn't mess with the scheduling like a blocking operation. So I, I haven't tested it. It was introduced on a blog post uh, on uh, Aka webpage, and they they had uh, they had they had tested it, and uh, it looks it looks much better. It again it always depends on your problem, and you should test it on your system. But it looks like it gives the CPU caching almost for free. Uh, if you compare it to, to previous solution to fork join pool. The, the problem with fork join pool is that when you create a new task, it usually lands on always on the same queue. So usually if you spawn an actor from another actor, it's a good thing to do, but when it isn't, the performance degrades. So that's why the affinity pool is like targeting this little problem, but I, I don't see in theory if it has any drawbacks to it. it it's just great. <laughs> I guess you have to model your data so that you didn't catch something that's like. Uh, I mean, you, you don't have to because, uh, I mean, you would have to so that you see the benefits. But if you don't, the benefits are just there. Okay, so I think that's all. Thank you very much.